It's 6 p.m. on a Monday here in Korea. Welcome to our newscast. I'm Daniel Che. Let's begin with the headlines. Similar activity to North Korea's fourth nuclear test detected at its Pungeri nuclear test site. Plus, the regime celebrates a special military anniversary. All signs indicating a fifth nuke test could be imminent. The fifth and latest press statement condemning North Korea's missile tests is accepted by the UN Security Council. Pyongyang will be under closer scrutiny and will face even harsher punishment for continuing its provocative acts. To maximize the effect of restructuring efforts, the government points out the need for struggling companies and creditors to coordinate and come up with effective measures while emphasizing its role as a supporting player. South Korean military is on high alert for North Korea's possible fifth nuclear test. Many experts believe Pyongyang could carry it out in the coming days and weeks. Kim Hyun bin has our top story. South Korea's military is on high alert, according to his defense ministry spokesman on Monday. We are currently preparing for a possible nuclear test by the North. Today is the anniversary of the establishment of North Korea's People's Army, so we are preparing for possible provocations. Satellite imagery shows that most of the vehicles at the Pungeri nuclear site have been evacuated, similar to when the North conducted its fourth nuclear test in January. North Korea claimed that it has successfully conducted a hydrogen bomb test earlier this year, and many experts believe it possible that the regime will conduct a miniaturized nuclear warhead test this time around. South Korea's military is looking for any signs of an imminent nuclear test from the North, saying that the regime is capable of conducting one at the push of a button. Many experts believe North Korea's fifth nuclear test could take place before the Workers' Party Congress in early May, which will be held for the first time in more than three and a half decades. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. And it appears as though South Korea and the U.S. are not taking North Korea's proposal on the halting nuclear test seriously. According to our Connie Kim, both nations are calling on Pyongyang to denuclearize and halt additional provocations with no conditions attached. South Korea called North Korea's proposal on halting the annual South Korea-U.S. military exercises in exchange for ceasing nuclear tests absurd. This comes as North Korean Foreign Minister Lee Soo-yong, during an interview with the Associated Press over the weekend, said that Pyongyang is ready to halt nuclear tests if Seoul and Washington stop the joint drills. Seoul's Unification Ministry said the North Korean diplomats' comments are intended to divert attention from further North Korea sanctions. North Korean Foreign Minister Lee Soo-yong's comments are an attempt to shift responsibility to Seoul and Washington. Pyongyang's intention seems to be on diverting attention from discussions on North Korea sanctions. This year's joint exercise is the largest to date, which the North views as a rehearsal for war. U.S. President Barack Obama also sent a consistent message to the North, saying Washington will be prepared to hold conversations if Pyongyang shows it is serious about denuclearization. The U.S. President also urged China, North Korea's closest ally, to increase pressure on the North and said the level of cooperation between Washington and Beijing has not reached optimum levels. If the North does conduct a fifth nuclear test, Washington is expected to push for the blocking of oil exports to the north, a measure that Beijing has been consistently opposed to. Connie Kim, Arirang News. UN Security Council quickly and strongly reacted to North Korea's attempt to test fire a submarine launch ballistic missile over the weekend. It reiterated that the launch is a clear violation of numerous resolutions adopted by the Council. Kwon Soa shares with us the UNSC's rapid response. The UN Security Council has condemned North Korea's SLBM test and expressed serious concern as it accepted a press statement Sunday signed by all 15 member countries. The statement says North Korea's missile test on Saturday was a clear violation of the Council's resolutions that banned Pyongyang from any type of ballistic missile tests, ranging from a resolution adopted in 2006 to the most recent and toughest one adopted earlier this year. The Council also stressed that failed launches are not an exception and that it will continue to closely monitor the situation and take further significant measures in line with its previously expressed determination. This marks the fifth time the UN Security Council has accepted statements on North Korea this year. 
Seoul's foreign ministry said Monday that South Korea, which is not a current member of the UN Security Council, closely cooperated with its allies, including the U.S., in the adoption of the statement and assessed Beijing as having complied to its role, just as it had when swiftly approving a statement against Pyongyang's failed launch of a mid-range Musudan ballistic missile on April 15th. Although press statements of this kind are not as powerful as resolutions, officials say the fact that it was approved by all members, including China and Russia, on a non-working day shows how seriously the international community is taking the situation, especially due to the chance of an imminent fifth nuclear test. With Pyongyang ignoring the punishments in the form of inspections of cargo, travel bans, economic and financial sanctions, some experts say North Korea's closest ally China should take the next step, such as severing oil exports that would severely hurt the North's overall economy. Kwon Suwa, Arirang News. Meanwhile, South Korea's National Assembly condemned North Korea on Monday for its continued provocations, including its SLBM launch and continued rumors of a possible fifth nuclear test. Jim Young-il brings us the reactions from South Korean lawmakers. The ruling Senate Party denounced North Korea for its continued provocative behavior in the face of repeated warnings by the international community. North Korea's unrelenting provocations will only isolate the North, accelerating the country's economic demise. These actions will only end in self-destruction. Floor leader Won stressed that Saturday's sea-based missile launch by North Korea was a clear violation of the UN Security Council resolutions. The ruling party emphasized that Seoul would work with the international community to levy tougher sanctions on Pyongyang and take the necessary further steps. The main opposition Minju Party of Korea and the minor People's Party also condemned the North for its provocations and called for international cooperation to increase pressure on Pyongyang. We must pressure North Korea through U.S. sanctions and China's tacit warnings. We must make the North stop its irresponsible provocations through dialogue. The two opposition parties called on the government to enhance national security by fortifying the military's combat readiness. They also urged enhancement of capabilities to deter Pyongyang from engaging in any nuclear weapons and missile threats in the future. All three parties ultimately agreed on the need to adopt a resolution to denounce Pyongyang's continuing threats and possible fifth nuclear test. The three parties are scheduled to meet on Wednesday when they're expected to discuss specific details of the joint resolution condemning North Korea. Kim young Arirang News. Now, despite continuous threats from North Korea, the South Korean government and the international community are ramping up pressure to get Pyongyang to address its dire human rights situation. South's Unification Ministry and the Network for North Korean Democracy and Human Rights kicked off a joint seminar on Monday to tackle challenges, challenges in ways to move forward following the recent passage of the North Korean Human Rights Act. In a separate move, South Korean, U.S. and Japanese human rights groups kicked off the 13th North Korea Freedom Week earlier in the day, putting the spotlight on abuses in the North as well as the role of defectors in the case that the regime collapses. Some 20 organizations are participating in the week-long event, including Suzanne Schulte, president of the Defense Forum Foundation, who will also be joining Arirang News's, Arirang's News Center rather, on Tuesday, 10 p.m. local time. South Korea and Germany reaffirmed their shared stances regarding both North Korean issues and cooperation for future growth on Monday. President Bakane sat down with German Bundesrat President Stanislav Tillichi, representing the upper house of German parliament. Tillichi accompanied President Bak on her visit to Dresden in 2014 as Minister President of Saxony, where she laid out her vision for reunification of the two Koreas. At the meeting, the two agreed to strengthen future-oriented partnership in the fields of creative economy and research and development, with Germany vowing full support for Seoul's drives toward denuclearizing Pyongyang. Korea's main political parties are focused on the next step after the elections in order to meet the public's needs and demands. Park Ji-won has the latest from the parliament. 
Ruling Saturday Party's 14 veteran lawmakers gathered to discuss ways to unite the Conservative Party after defeat in the general elections. During their one-hour luncheon presided over by floor leader Wan yoo Char on Monday, the lawmakers stressed the need to face the current crisis through self-reflection and revamp the party. During the party's one-day workshop scheduled for Tuesday, opinions of party members are expected to be solicited regarding establishing temporary party leadership until the new assembly at the end of next May. Newly elected lawmakers will also participate in the event. The leadership of the main opposition Minju Party of Korea visited Gwangju, the biggest city in southwestern Jeolladu province, on Monday for the first time since the general election. The Liberal Party witnessed a crushing defeat in their traditional stronghold despite a positive performance in the Seoul metropolitan areas. The party's interim leader Kim Jong-in and the party's floor leader Lee jong er hope to regain the trust of locals, most of whom voted for the minor people's party in the election. They said they will continue efforts to bring Samsung Electronics' future car plan to the region. However, all 13 of the city's municipal assembly members, who are also party members, boycotted a meeting with Kim, indicating the city's deep dissatisfaction with current party leadership. Meanwhile, the centrist People's Party decided to maintain its two top leadership structure of former presidential candidate An Chul Su and former Justice Minister and six-term lawmaker Chan Jung Bae until a party convention, which was originally scheduled in July but postponed to December. The party said it will now focus on recruiting more talent for local elections in 2018. The Splinter Party also plans to select and endorse new floor leadership during a two-day party workshop beginning Tuesday. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. A prolonged slump in global crude prices has been good for oil-related industries, but bad news for others. Among hardest hit are Korea's shipbuilding giants who experienced eye-watering losses on the back of canceled orders and delayed construction. Kim Min-ji looks beyond the numbers. Korea's big three shipbuilders, namely Hyundai Heavy Industries, Daewoo Shipbuilding and Marine Engineering, and Samsung Heavy Industries, have been in choppy water, so to speak, struggling to stay afloat amid falling orders as well as the rise of Chinese competition. Last year, they posted a combined loss of roughly 7 billion U.S. dollars and as a result have been downsizing their labor forces. Hyundai is expected to lay off about 3,000 people this year after letting go of some 1,300 workers last year. More than 100 of its subcontractors also closed down last year. Samsung has also cut almost 30 executive-level workers since last September, while Daewoo is accepting voluntary resignations among some 300 high-level employees. 16 contractors of the company have also closed down since the end of last year, with some 3,400 people losing their jobs. All in all, some 15,000 people were laid off last year, and that figure is set to increase this year once the shipbuilders complete construction of offshore facilities scheduled to begin delivery next year. But it's a different story for the oil refining and petrochemical industries, which have been able to benefit from low global oil prices and increased refinement margins. Workers have also received performance-based incentives amounting to between 700 and 800 percent of their monthly wages. With global oil prices decreasing by more than half, there's been cancellations of offshore plants and no new orders. On the other hand, oil-related industries have been doing well thanks to increased demand and refining margins. The situation may get better for shipyards if oil prices rise to about $60 a barrel, but that's not expected this year. The Korean government on Tuesday will announce a financing plan for industries that urgently need to be restructured, with a priority given to shipping and shipbuilding. Korea's finance minister Yoo Ye-ro says the utmost priority should be the measures and efforts taken by the companies and creditors, and that the government's role should be to support them. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News. Long-term slow growth has already begun for Korea's economy, according to economists. A survey conducted by the Federation of Korean Industries earlier this month shows that 70 percent of the 61 economists surveyed said the nation has already entered a period of slower economic growth, with 80 percent citing weakening economic strength. 
The experts say the nation is facing a delay in economic reforms, loss of competitiveness against Chinese companies, and income balance. Over 90 percent said it will be difficult for the Korean economy to recover, even when the global economy bounces back. Broadcasters, venture firms and local experts gather for a seminar on T-commerce, which enables real-time buying and selling of products through interactive television. The event focused on identifying current issues and obstacles that are slowing down the development of this rising commerce platform. The Korea Communications Commission and the Ministry of Science, ICT and Future Planning say, based on their discussions during the seminar, more efforts will be made to improve related guidelines as well as ease regulations to help boost the new business model. We've come to the end of our newscast. Thank you for watching.